lively and unrehearsed. It happens as it happens. We call it moral side of the news. We're glad you're alongside. I'm John Blim with the WHAS Crusade for Children. With me, as always, is a distinguished panel on this week's program. Reverend Jason Crosby, Center College. Father Joe Graffis, Archdiocese of Louisville. Reverend Dr. Kylan Gray, Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And Rabbi Stan Miles, Louisville Melton School. Our first topic up today, the controversial Safer Kentucky Act. This wide-ranging bill in the Kentucky legislature has supporters and critics alike. Some say it would improve public safety. Others predict it would create a mass incarceration problem and criminalize poverty and homelessness. Panel, let's turn to you and give us your take on this 72-page bill. First of all, I haven't read it, full disclosure, but I've read about it. And it, to me, it's, it seems like it's Jefferson County centric and it is draconian in the worst possible ways. You know, when I drive down to the studio to record this program, I pass an expressway overpass and more often than not, it has turned into a very small, tense city. And I just wonder what kind of world it is that in the, the end of January, we have human beings living outside under an expressway overpa overpass. There has to be a solution, and the solution isn't attacking this population. The solution is once again doing what we did 40 years ago, 40 years ago, providing safety nets to this very vulnerable population and helping them, helping them live as human beings. I think one of the things that strikes me about the bill, I have not read the bill either, but when I look at all the items in the bill, it's like this omnibus bill, which is a catch-all of a bunch of different things. And uh, interesting, some things you could be for, uh, or maybe are positive, and some things seem to be, as Stan used the word draconian, uh, and so it seems like it should have been divided into uh, sections to say, okay, let's deal with this issue. For example, fentanyl uh, and drug overdose. Uh, I've had funerals of five or six different kids who died of that, those overdoses, and something has to be done. I'm not sure throwing everybody into jail is the solution by any means. We've got too many people in jail, but how, how do we are preventing this? We're, we're thinking negative thoughts rather than being proactive in many of these issues. Proactive social policies don't fit a, a political campaign nor a political tenure. <laughs> the solutions for these would go well beyond the time that it would take for good, comprehensive, radical policies to be done. Uh, this bill worries me. It worries me on a multiple levels. There's a lot of things included in it. Primarily the uh, criminalization of drug use, <clears throat> the criminalization of uh, the increasing of penalties on certain crimes. Um, we can't uh, not be aware of the fact that crime is big business in this country. Mm. And that there's a lot of companies who make profits with increased inmates, you doing a lot of the grunt work for those companies, and it makes for very profitable gains for these companies. My wonder is who's really pushing these legislators to develop these types of policies that would ultimately increase incarceration and the increase in, in make it even more mass incarceration to make that in existence within our country adds to the ability of these companies who benefit from those inmates who create products for their companies. It's, it's, so my, my wonder is that is this an economic issue that is for those who have unified in an association uh, to keep incarceration high in this country. The other thing is that this country should have learned 
from all of our past war on crime, war on drug uh, experiences, that the harsh penalties does not deter crime. I don't think that any, uh, they can make the argument, the persons can make the statement, but the experience of cities in this nation is very clear <clears throat> that harsher jail terms are not deterrents. Law, uh, the, the, the past, past, putting people in jail for long terms, death penalty sentences, does not deter crime. But what does det deter crime is what we don't have the patience to do, and that is to really understand the root cause of poverty. Poverty drives every element of criminal activity in this country. And we just don't have the patience, the bandwidth, or the moral will to begin to work together across party lines, across community boundaries, and really solve the root of homelessness and crime, which has to do with poverty. If we ever resolve the poverty issue, it'll go a long way uh, with helping to make our community safer instead of just going straight to the uh, incarceration solution. It does not work, it has not worked, and we just don't have enough imagination within legislators to look at what could really impact our communities. Um, this, this bill is vast in its scope. Yes. Uh, we've touched mm -hmm. upon <clears throat> several aspects that this bill addresses from criminalization of homelessness uh, to uh, lengthier sentences for certain violations, um, um, the, the criminalization or, or heightened penalties for fentanyl distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to highlight another aspect of this uh, wide-ranging piece of proposed legislation, and that's the ability for store owners to mm. have greater right. discretion yes. in use yes. of force, Yes. Um, yes. be it against a, a shoplifter or uh, uh, some other uh, patron or, or someone who might be trying to violate that, mm. that, that shop in some way or capacity. Again, have we not learned <laughs> anything, anything? Um, it, it feels as if certain cycles uh, are repeating themselves in this bill, be it um, the ineffectiveness or the destructive nature of, of the war on drugs and the way in which it's ravished mm -hmm. communities, yes. and this is a, a repeat in some respects of that. Uh, but then to see that, that, that piece of this legislation, uh, uh, the, the use of force um, by shopkeepers, it's, it's up to their discretion and determination. It's reminis reminiscent to me of stand your ground yes, laws yes. Um, that have been enacted um, in, in recent years, mm -hmm. uh, but expanding um, that, that ability and that scope to, to those who are owners of shops, managers, and so forth. Again, just another example of the ways in which uh, this wide-ranging piece of legislation uh, can, can do yet another degree of harm. Uh, one other comment I wanted to, to make very quickly, Kylan, picking up on what you were saying about the lack of creativity and imagination when it comes to resolving underlying problems, is there are other pieces of legislation making their way through Frankfurt at the moment, <clears throat> and that includes uh, one piece of legislation that grants um, landlords and renters the ability to discriminate against those who would be paying for the rental property using um, Section 8 or federally subsidized mm -hmm. vouchers. Yeah. The underlying cause of homelessness in Louisville and across the country is a lack of access to affordable housing. Yes. Yes. We're criminalizing it here in this bill. And at the same time, in a separate bill, we're making it more difficult for people to get access to long-term stable shelter. Hmm. Yeah. That is just cruel. Yeah. It is just cruel. And it ultimately leads to this cycle of incarceration and problems uh, that you described, Kylan. Um, uh, but, but that just, again, is a glaring example of how these, these different moving pieces fit together in my mind. Another issue that's in this bill is 
a, a, a mandatory death penalty right. for pol shooting of police officers. Correct. And uh, mm -hmm. here we, five or six, seven years ago, we were very close in the state to eliminating the death penalty. And, uh, and now suddenly we're adding that, which is does not solve the problem, does not yeah. deter crime. Uh, I, you know, God love our police officers, but uh, that, that again is another one of those things that we're, we're using something because it looks nice politically to some factions rather than solving the problem. So is there just too much in this bill? And we're, we've only scratched the surface as we've talked for the first 10 or 11 minutes of this program. Is there <laughs> just too much? Yes. Well, mm -hmm. It's too much, but also there's a racial element to all of this. Mm -hmm. And the racial element is, particularly when you think about the piece of, of the legislation about shoplifting, mm -hmm. uh, it takes the African-American community to have a microphone and talk about the right. countless times that they have been mis- charged or right. falsely charged with shoplifting. It's, it's, it's a or, major issue or, within our or, community. Or, That's why or, I wanted to understand. Or followed that. around the store. And they're followed around the store yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. And so can you imagine a store owner with a gun that's trigger happy Oh. that's assuming somebody is shoplifting and can, can shoot indiscriminately and that's considered a reasonable use of force mm -hmm. this is this is a this is a a recipe for disaster but it has significant racial elements the uh, increase of penalties for the crimes even with fentanyl uh, distribution right. mm -hmm. the same with any other type of distribution of drugs there's this misnomer that it's that you're going after the drug uh, s dealer or the drug seller when they're users as well. So right. we're, we're really, we don't have any imagination to address these things from a public and health And they're the middlemen. Yes. And there are the people who are financing this that are friends of all of the people who are in power. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it just goes up the ladder. It's, it's, it's another example of penalizing people with no power at all and causing them to pay for the sense of safety, which all this, all this bill can only do is give people a false sense of safety when there's no safety that's garnered at all. It's a regression. When you were speaking, Kylan, I, I was reminded of what, what life was like in Atlanta, Georgia in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. There was a guy who owned a restaurant and he was an arch segregationist. His name was Lester Maddox. Yeah. And yeah. He, mm. he provided to his customers axe handles so that if the wrong type of person wanted to eat his fried chicken, mm -hmm. they would be dealt with. Yeah. Uh, no, of course, Lester Maddox eventually became the governor of Georgia. Right. right. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. now I think we're w with this law in Kentucky, we are going the direction that this kind of behavior, which was cruel and horrible and unacceptable in the 1960s, could become business as usual yeah. in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Yeah. And I, I think that we all recognize and, and are in agreement, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. That there are issues that need to be addressed. Yes, right. absolutely. Sure. absolutely. Homelessness, absolutely. Yes. crime, violence. Affordable housing. Uh, affordable. There, there are serious issues that we are contending with as a city and as a commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, but, but these attempts to address those problems uh, will only exacerbate the existing absolutely. problems absolutely. that are currently uh, in place and are largely being pushed. I think it's worth noting the bill sponsors and others that are supportive of this are principally Jefferson County representatives yep. in Frankfurt who are all up for re-election this year. All right, well, we'll, see. we'll see where this goes there with the Safer <laughs> Kentucky Act. Thanks for watching and listening to Moral Side of the News. We're about halfway through this program today. Second topic, the mass shooting at Old hmm. National Bank in Louisville on April 10th is back in the headlines. Survivors and families of those killed are suing the gun shop that sold the rifle used to kill five and injure many more. The suit claims the store overlooked red flags, such as selling the weapon and including extra magazines, a red dot sight, and a pistol grip. Panel, 
Was this lawsuit expected, and what do you think will come of it? Any impact? It's going to be interesting to see how the courts deal with this, given our gun laws. Uh, it's certainly, from a societal standpoint, what was raised, and I think even the story that you sent us, John, about this, somebody was in the store at the time and said, this young man seems to be emotionally unstable and doesn't know how to handle a gun and was very perplexed as to why they would sell an AK-15 to somebody like that, uh, which is not exactly a, a defense weapon. Uh, so, I mean, I think it goes back to the whole question of healthy uh, goods gun legislation, uh, which obviously is not going to get anywhere given the political climate we're in. Uh, but I think uh, the protectors of guns are going to be against this suit, and I don't know whether the courts will back them up or not. I'm not optimistic. <laughs> it's, uh, there has to be s some deal, some type of control, and obviously the, uh, the folks in that, uh, in that business were oblivious to the consequences that they were that they were sowing the seeds there too. And uh, my heart goes out to the families mm -hmm. who are mounting yes. the suit. Yes. Because this is causing them to relive, relive the most tragic situation in their lives. And why? Because simply they don't want it to happen again to someone else. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think it's important mm -hmm. to note that according to or under legislation passed by the federal government in 2005, gun dealers are largely immune from lawsuits unless negligence mm -hmm. uh, can mm -hmm. be demonstrated or proven. But that degree and, and what would qualify as negligence is certainly something that, that um, is a high bar to overcome. Um, however, um, I, I, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to point out um, that there is an important role for remedying wrongs through civil litigation. Um, this is not a criminal proceeding against this gun dealership right, right. or against a gun manufacturer that might come. This is a, a civil proceeding at the moment. The families are essentially, in so doing, looking at some way, some sort of recourse, while the dealer does not have any criminal issue levied against him or her. It's a civil matter. Um, and and it's, it's important to hold certain individuals that are profiting, be it in gun dealership and manufacturing, car dealership and manufacturing, any sort of product that we might purchase that could do us harm, to have these tools at our disposal. And there are active forces in places like Frankfurt and Washington, D.C., who want to limit That's right. the, the ability of the consumer and the individual that are harmed by products, dealership, manufacturing. It's called tort reform. Yes. Uh, tort reform is a way to lessen the power of the public at the benefit of the dealers and manufacturers. Uh, and certainly there's uh, regulation that could be put in place, legislation as it relates to gun reform. But another important component in this matter or in any matter is, is access to civil litigation and holding people responsible where they feel it the most. That's the pocketbook. I agree with that. I think the uh, families, it is their right to have any type of redress that they can manage. Um, and the general public who are the victims of these types of things have not that much recourse, especially if you can't afford an attorney, mm -hmm. es especially if you have uh, economic limitations that keep you from speaking. And those who don't have economic means use microphones and protests to make their voice heard. Um, so I, I support the families um, 
um, attempts to gain some type of um, redress for the, for the pain that they're having. My heart definitely goes out to the families. Um, there's not a lot of support while there's the immunity law that exists within federal and state regulations. There's no support for gun owners or, or store owners to be able to discern yeah. uh, those persons that even would be suspected that they, if they were, if it was placed upon them to, be, to determine who to sell a gun to and who not to, while the legislation gives immunity for these store owners, that's not enough. There needs to be some support for these store owners to be able to know, okay, what am I looking for? What are the signs I need to see? If they can even be discerned so that I can at least question a little bit and hold back and ask a little bit more questions. Because the gun shop owner is the front line, it's especially the front in line, this case, as we heard from the which eyewitness move, testimony. Which even discussion. moves forward to a more need for our community, and that is we are paupers in mental health support and mental right. health community supports. Because we're talking about we're talking about people who take guns and do mass murder. We're talking about a mental health issue. It is not the cause of it. It's a major contributor to it. And so we don't completely blame the mental health issue for a mass murder or a mass shooting. But it's definitely a consideration. But again, it's another example to me of a lack of imagination within legislators and city leaders and state leaders on how to re have a comprehensive approach. We just have this one approach. If you want to buy a gun, get a gun. Nothing should be able to stop you from getting a gun. Um, if you've committed domestic violence, uh, where it used to be where you couldn't get a gun, they're trying to change laws if they have not already done change, already changed laws with that to where even people who have had history with domestic violence can still get violent uh, weapons. It's, 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 a, it's an insidious and sad state where we are t we've tilted our society toward the protection of guns and gun owners against the safety of the community. So how can we talk about both sides of our neck that we want a safer community by passing draconian laws of incarceration, but then have nothing to say legislatively about gun ownership and what to do with how to make uh, the community safe from persons who tend to do and bad the, things. The irony, of course, is mm -hmm. using autos as an example. We're required to have seat belts, That's you know, right. mm -hmm. for the safety of the person that's involved. Or, and there are rules about whether you can get a car or, mm -hmm. or under what conditions Mm -hmm. We do that all the time with something that can be very deadly. That's right. Uh, and But can also do great service to us. But how we don't see the safety in both issues as compatible are some things that we need to do to prevent bad things happening is just absurd. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a scale, there's a balance in mm -hmm. terms of a, a, the sale of a gun. <clears throat> On one hand, there's there's the motivation to make that sale and that profit, yes. I understand. Yes. On the other hand, we're asking those dealers or sellers to consider or factor in mental health concerns that might arise at the point of sale. But here's the thing, and where everything gets thrown off in favor of selling the gun and the profit is that um, the ability to be held liable for selling that is far outweighed that, that, that risk is far outweighed by the profit, and there's no, no uh, other mechanism, no other arbitrator uh, in place at that moment of decision. At, of sale, yeah. at that moment mm -hmm. of decision. Mm -hmm. um, and then, if they do mess up and sell it to someone they shouldn't sell it to, you have a whole system behind, behind that that says the likelihood of being held liable um, is, is slim. Yes. There are protections yes. set up against that. Yeah. Okay, we've got about four minutes left. Thank you for that discussion. We'll change it up a little lighter topic here today. <laughs> yes, please. In my best Alex Trebek impersonation. And the answer is <laughs> the first vice president and the first president not born in one of the original 13 states were born in this state. The answer, what is Kentucky? That was the question on Jeopardy this week and panel. No one on Jeopardy got it right. So, number one, too bad on that, but it pays to know our history. You could have won a bunch of money on Jeopardy this week. Right. 
and all of us know about Abe Lincoln. I wasn't sure about the other, the vice presidential potential candidate. That was a Is that new imprint. No, it wasn't. was it John Tyler? No, Ooh, it, was, uh, it was Van, Van Buren's, Buren's vice president. president. And the Kentucky and the vice president's name still eludes me, even though I right. did my homework before the show. Oh, <laughs> well, we'll Google it after this program. But uh, it was on Jeopardy. Okay, another topic for you today. This one I like too. Beam to the stars with the modified laser, Lexington's Tourism Bureau invited aliens to come enjoy the city and what it has to offer. This was approved by the FAA. Visit Lex sent the molecular structure of bourbon, horse and bluegrass pictures, of course. and a blue, blues music recording. So, Panel, what happens if something from out there comes here? <laughs> uh, it's quite an idea. I, I can answer that in one phrase. With the climate of the Commonwealth of Kentucky <laughs> now, I would say, God help it. <laughs> help the alien? <laughs> More or less. <laughs> I think some of us already thought there were aliens present. Yes. You know. Yes. <laughs> well, well put. Well yes. Put. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting. I said, uh, I hope they like bourbon, though. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I get a little, please? Uh, two minutes left. Serious on this. Sure. Two minutes left. In our shared tradition, we are concerned with the stranger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The alien is the ultimate stranger, but our tradition says to us what? Love the stranger, because we know what it feels to be a stranger. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that more in play in, in this situation and virtually in everything we've spoken about today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Right. Indeed. Well said. Thank you, Steve. Our, our religious traditions speak about the care for the poor, the vulnerable, mm -hmm. the sick, the orphan, the widow, and uh, sometimes it seems like those standards do not hold true in our politics today. So welcome all and love all. <laughs> Amen. Alien or Amen. not. Amen. Stranger, etc. All right, that'll bring to a close this edition of Moral Side of the News. Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you to Jason Crosby, Joe Graffis, Kylan Gray, and Stan Miles. You can catch this program again anytime. Just go to YouTube and search for Moral Side of the News. It'll be posted up there every Monday. So until next time, we'll be back with an all-new program next week. Until then, join us. The topics and conversation will continue here on Moral Side of the News. Until then, so long for now. Thanks.